SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. I'd like to introduce today our speaker, Tiffany Prete, uh, Indigenous children enduring more than just uh, Indian residential schools. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Oki Nistu Nidanagu Apoyaki. My name is Tiffany Heimbol Preet, and I'm uh, really excited to be here today to share with you my research. I'm a member of the Blood Tribe, uh, which is part of Blackfoot Confederacy, and found in Treaty 7, uh, which is the land that we currently uh, are together gathered. I'm also an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Lethbridge, and I am an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential schools. And for the past nearly decade of my life, I have spent researching about my people's uh, past with colonization and the colonial school system. And uh, so today I'm gonna be speaking on my research uh, and sharing with you uh, the colonial school system on the Blood Reserve. Uh, are you able to hear me just fine? Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. And I wanted to thank Ned Peterson for inviting me here today. Okay, is this much better? Okay, <laughs> perfect, thank you. So I always like to start off my presentations by giving a land acknowledgement, uh, and that helps me to locate myself and my work. And in case you're not familiar with Six to Gate to be traditional territory, so that's Blackfoot Confederacy territory, I'm going to introduce where our traditional uh, boundaries and, and territory was. So we originally occupied the land from the North Saskatchewan River east to the Sand Hills in Saskatchewan, south to the Yellowstone River, and west to the Rocky Mountains. And Blackfoot Confederacy is comprised of four tribes. We have Siksiga, which is by Calgary, Begani by Pincher Creek, and then we've got Ghana, that's here by Lethbridge, and then we have Amskapi Begani, which is in the United States. So uh, Siksiga seem to be traditional territories both in Canada and the United States. So this is a picture of uh, Nanastico, and which is part of my people's traditional territory. And just to introduce a little bit about the Blood Tribe, we are the Blackfoot tribe that's located next to the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, so next to Nanastico, or Chief Mountain. And my reserve is located in southwestern Alberta. We're about 20 minutes north of the Canada-US border. We are the largest land-based reserve in Canada. And we're just short of being 1,500 square kilometers. And we have a band membership of over 13,000 members. So today, I'm gonna to go over some of the most common questions that you might have about the Stolen Children era. And I use the language of the Stolen Children era instead of saying the residential school era, because within my own research, I discovered that the Canadian government devised multiple school models to try and assimilate Indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life. And the residential school model is just one of the models that the Canadian government used. And today, the residential school model receives a lot of attention, and rightfully so, as we do have many survivors today who attended residential school. And so, to represent this entire era, that the government used education as a tool to assimilate Indigenous children, I use the language of the Stolen Children era. So specifically today, I'm going to focus my presentation on truth and reconciliation, and then we'll end with a Q&A. And in the first half of the talk, I'll be focusing on truth-telling, and truth-telling is a term that we use in Canada when referring to what happened to the, during the Stolen Children era from the perspective of those who have first-hand accounts and experiences with this era. So we're talking about survivors, the children who attended these schools and grew up in these institutions. Historically, in Canada, we have focused telling this history of this era from a colonial perspective, and I invite you to being open to considering a new perspective that you may not be very familiar with, 
and as you consider these new perspectives, I hope that you're willing to challenge some of the beliefs and assumptions that you might have formed through other sources that favored a colonial perspective. And in the latter half of the presentation, I'll focus on reconciliation. And specifically, I'll speak about the importance of Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and why reconciliation is still relevant today and why each of us should consider engaging in reconciliation work. So to start off, I'm going to cover the basics about the Canadian government's colonial school system and the role that Christian denominations played in, this, in these institutions. As we know, there were several Christian denominations that the Canadian government partnered with to run the different school models throughout the Stolen Children era, which began during the 1880s. And so you might wonder why the Canadian government partnered with Christian religions in the first place. Prior to the 1880s, there were Christian denominations who were already engaged in missionary work across pre-Confederate Canada, and missions continued to be established after Confederation. And these missions, in most cases, already had some type of existing infrastructure, and they received funding previously from their own religions. And so these religions had the means and the workforce to open and operate schools under the direction of the Canadian government. And the use of Christian religion was also favored as one of the goals that the Canadian government had for Indigenous peoples using their own terminology was to civilize Indigenous peoples. And we know this because of the different acts and legislation that the Canadian government created. And so you may have heard of the Indian Act, uh, and the Indian Act is actually its abbreviated name. So this is just a picture of uh, some of the different missionaries who've worked uh, within Canada and within uh, Northwest Canada as well. So this is a picture of the very first Indian Act. Its full name is an act to amend and consolidate the laws respecting Indians. And so this means that there were many acts and legislations uh, that was previously created to control and dominate Indigenous peoples prior to the Indian Act coming out, uh, which was in 1876. And one of the previous acts was called the Gradual Civilization Act that came out in 1857. And I'm going to read an excerpt for you from the Gradual Civilization Act. Open quote, whereas it is desirable to encourage the progress of civilization among the Indian tribes and the gradual removal of all legal distinctions between them and Her Majesty's other Canadian subjects and to facilitate the acquisition of property and of the rights accompanying it by such individual members of the said tribes as shall be found to desire such encouragement and to have deserved it. And so the act continues to go on to outline how the Canadian government envisioned indigenous peoples giving up their identities and their rights, and this is called enfranchisement, in order to become a citizen of this country. The act outlines some of the elements, such as working with missionaries and becoming baptized. And there was this belief that civilization equated to being a Christian and to being which means that to be indigenous meant to be not civilized under the law. And if you study all of these laws and legislations, you will see that there is Christian rhetoric written throughout these laws and legislations in regards to indigenous peoples. And so the goal of these institutions was not to create well-educated indigenous peoples. Instead, it was to educate indigenous peoples to be educated just enough to be considered civilized. The Canadian government created a standard that they believed represented what civilization looked like and wanted all indigenous peoples to reach the so-called standard. And the main tool that the Canadian government used to reach the standard was the colonial school system, where they felt that they would be in a better position to try and assimilate indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life. So the Canadian government believed that once children met this level of standard, that they would no longer want to be indigenous, that indigenous people would willingly forego or give up their indigenous identities in order to become a Canadian citizen. Johnny MacDonald, who was the first Prime Minister of Canada, once said, the government will in time reach the end of its responsibility as the Indians progress into civilization and finally disappear as a separate and distinct people, not by race extinction, but by gradual assimilation with their fellow citizens. So I'm going to read to you what the assimilative standard is that the Canadian government devised through the early laws and legislation. 
Oakman quote, is able to speak and write either the English or the French language readily and well, and is sufficiently advanced in the elementary branches of education, and is of good moral character and free from debt, close quote. In addition to this standard, the Canadian government devised that Indigenous peoples would either become farmers or ranchers. And since we are gathered today on the lands of Blackfoot Confederacy, who signed Treaty 7, I'm going to read to you an excerpt from the original Treaty 7 that reads, open quote, and further Her Majesty agrees that the said Indian shall be supplied as soon as convenient after any ban shall make due application therefore with the following cattle for raising stock. But if any ban desire to cultivate the soil as well as raise stock, all the aforesaid articles to be given once for all for the encouragement of the practice of agriculture among the Indians. And so the tribes had to decide if they primarily wanted to focus on ranching or farming. And that became the basis of the type of education that indigenous children received in the colonial school system that they attended. And so in many cases, indigenous children who entered the colonial school system during the stolen children era only received an elementary education. And many of them graduated with only a grade three, a grade four, a grade five, or a grade six education. Indigenous male children were educated to become either a farmer or a rancher, and indigenous female children were raised to become the wife of either a farmer or a rancher. And this type of education carried on for nearly 80 years during the Stolen Children era. On my reserve, it wouldn't be until about the 1960s that the colonial schools offered grade 12. This is a picture of the very first graduating class on the Blood Reserve who attended St. Mary's on the Blood Reserve. So I'm going to touch very briefly about what happened in these institutions. We now have many brave survivors who have spoken up and come forward to share their experiences and accounts with the colonial school system and how they experienced physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual abuse at the hands of the adults who were entrusted to educate them and for their upbringing. And I encourage you to engage with the material that is already published by Indigenous survivors and their families. Some good resources that you might consider are reports, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reports, which includes Honoring the Truth, Reconciling the Future. It's a summary of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation of Canada. There's also what we learned, and this is about the principles of truth and reconciliation. We have the Survivors Speak. It's a report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. There is also Canada's Residential Schools, The History, Part 1, Origins to 1939. Canada's Residential Schools, The History, Part 2, 1939 to 2000. Canada's Residential Schools, The Inuit and Northern Experience. Canada's Residential Schools, The Métis Experience. Canada's Residential Schools, Missing Children and Unmarked Burials. Canada's Residential Schools, The Legacy. And the last one is Canada's Residential Schools and Reconciliation. And you can find this online at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. There's also documentaries and cinema that you might be interested in taking a look at. We have Muffins for Granny by Nadia McLaren, who's Ojibwe and tells the story of her grandmother and other survivors who attended the residential school system. We have We Were Children by Tim Mula Chadiak, who shares the story of real life survivors, Glenn Anaquad and Lina Hart, about their experiences attending Guy Hill Residential School in Manitoba and the Labrette Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan. We have Indian Horse by Stephen Campanelli that's based on the book written by Richard Wagamese about the life of hockey player Saul Indian Horse and his experience with the Indian Residential School. And there's also Bones of Crow by Marie Clements, and you can watch this as a mini-series. It's based on true events of one family with their experience with residential school, dealing with trauma and intergenerational trauma, as well as seeking justice. There are web documentaries like the Legacy of Hope Foundation on their website. They have residential school survivor stories. So you can navigate to their website and click on the different stories of survivors and what their experiences were at residential school. 
and I highly recommend that you bring a box of Kleenex as you engage with this material. What we learned from the laws and legislations that we've already talked about in this presentation so far is how the colonizers and society viewed indigenous peoples from a negative lens, or we could say a deficit lens. And this view was already well established before Canada even became a country. There was a universal belief that indigenous peoples were not civilized and that they needed to become civilized. Otherwise, there wouldn't be all of these laws and legislations written about them and how the government was going to try and civilize them. And to obtain this so-called civilization for indigenous peoples, they used any means to try and reach this objective, which included taking advantage of the most vulnerable population in Canada, and that is the indigenous children. They took these children away from their parents, their family, their language, their culture, everything that they know, and placed them in these institutions that practiced physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual abuse in order to obtain a colonial view of what civilization is. So you might wonder, how did the rest of Canada allow such things to happen? But we have to remember, the Canadian government did such a good job at creating a negative perception of Indigenous peoples that it was a strong belief across Canada that Indigenous peoples needed to be civilized. As well, when Canada negotiated the number of treaties, which is one through 11, the placement of reserves were meant to be out of sight and out of mind. So this is a picture of all of the uh, First Nations reserves across Canada, and you can see the placement of them uh, compared to um, where the capitals and, and other parts in Canada are. So when you're out of sight and out of mind, the rest of the country probably doesn't have a very good idea about what's happening because they're not interacting with Indigenous peoples on a regular basis. And today, I receive a lot of comments from people that I'm the very first Indigenous person that they've ever had a conversation with or even have met. Justice Mary Sinclair, who is chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, gives us some insight into what was being taught in Canadian school system at the time for non-Indigenous children when they learned about Indigenous peoples. So I'm going to read a quote from him. Seven generations of children went through the residential schools, and each of those children who were educated were told that their lives were not as good as the lives of non-Aboriginal people of this country. They were told that their languages, their cultures weren't relevant. They were told that their people and their ancestors were heathens and pagans and uncivilized and needed to give up that way of life to come to a different way of living. At the same time that that was going on, non-Aboriginal children in the non-Aboriginal school system of this country were also being told the same thing about Aboriginal people. I was never taught about the Stolen Children era or about residential schools during my formal public education. And on the day of my high school graduation ceremony, I had one of my classmates tell me how lucky I was that my mother grew up in a residential school. And I was absolutely flabbergasted by this comment. And when I finally found my voice again, I told my non-Indigenous classmate, no, you are the lucky one that your parents never grew up in a residential school. And even though during my generation, we were not taught about residential schools or the stolen children era, we somehow were taught that residential schools were good places to grow up. And there was this general belief in Canada that residential schools were wonderful. And if that was the belief that existed at that time, and especially during the height of residential schools, why would society change something that they ultimately believed to be good? But now that we do know the truth and how these places were not wonderful to grow up in, what do we do now? The need for civilization is a lie used to justify the colonizers' actions, and those actions were wrong then, and they are still wrong today. The actions taken during the Stolen Children era and the abuse that Indigenous children suffered for over a century and a half have led to, according to Statistics Canada, a lower life expectancy compared to the non-Indigenous population in Canada. There's a higher incidence of disease, including diabetes, arthritis, hypertension, obesity, asthma, and cancer. And one key consideration that often receives little to no attention is the mental trauma created by the colonial policies and practices during this era. Many Indigenous children who grew up in one of these institutions left the system suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. 
And historically, services were not offered to address this issue. And as a result, today, Indigenous peoples experience higher rates of suicide and mental health issues, including addictions, than any other racial group in Canada. The actions that took place during the Stolen Children era have been identified as cultural genocide. And this is exactly why Canada needs reconciliation. So in the last half of my talk, I'm going to talk about the importance of reconciliation. I still receive comments today from people that they have never heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And so today, I'm going to go over a very brief history of how the Truth and Reconciliation of Commission of Canada has come into existence. Some people may wonder why the Stolen Children era lasted for so long and why no one spoke out. And the short answer is survivors did speak out. However, Indigenous people have been and are still limited in what actions we can take because of the Indian Act. And so I'm going to go over a few of the laws and legislations that the Canadian government previously implemented that made it really hard for us to be able to advocate for ourselves. The first one was in 1894, when it became compulsory for children to attend school. And this is an excerpt from that particular Indian Act. Open quote, such regulations, in addition to any other provisions deemed expedient, may provide for the arrest and conveyance to school and detention there of truant children and of children who are prevented by their parents or guardians from attending. And such regulations may provide for the punishment upon summary conviction by a fine or imprisonment or both of parents and guardians or persons having the charge of children who fail, refuse, or neglect to cause such children to attend school. Close quote. There was also an amendment made to the Indian Act in 1927 that made it law that Indigenous peoples could not hire a lawyer to take any recourse against the Canadian government. So any lawyer who would take us on would be punished by having to pay a fine and spending time in jail. Not a very appealing proposition for a lawyer to take on any Indigenous clients. And so under the law, we had to follow exactly what was dictated to us under the Indian Act or face harsh punishments. And under the law, we had no way of protecting ourselves or our children. And as we just learned, we had to send our children to one of these schools. Because if we didn't, and if parents or the guardians did not comply, sending their children to one of these institutions, they could be fined, imprisoned, or both. And that was the guilt that Indigenous children had to live with. They knew that if they did not go to school, or if they ran away from the school, that their parents would be punished. And isn't that awful to put children in such a situation and to have to live with that responsibility? Such actions could be considered emotional abuse. There was also an expectation that students who left the school, that they would say nothing. And they were expected to leave the school and continue on with their life without talking about anything that happened to them in these schools. In some cases, survivors were taught that if they said anything bad about their experiences, that they would burn in hell. Again, this could be considered a form of emotional abuse. There are some survivors who, because of this conditioning, could not speak out. And so great was the conditioning of the rest of Canada in the belief that Indigenous peoples needed to be civilized and that residential schools were great places that those early survivors who did speak out were unfortunately not believed. But things started to change in the 1980s and the 1990s when more survivors came forward to speak their truth. And eventually, without getting into the historical context, the Indian Act was repealed, amended to repeal the section where Indigenous peoples could not hire a lawyer, and we were now free to hire lawyers. Individual survivors tried to take the Canadian government and the Christian churches responsible for the operation of these schools to court. But the challenge was that you first had to find a lawyer who was willing to take you on as a client. And there were survivors who were initially rejected, unfortunately. But as more survivors spoke out, in the mid-1990s, individuals were filing class action suits against the Canadian government and the religions for their actions. And because there were so many individuals filing a class action suit against the government, it was decided that these claims would come together, and eventually it became the National Class Action Settlement, which took place in 1995. And this would become the largest class action settlement in Canadian history at that time. And as the Canadian government had to compensate all of the survivors who, were, uh, who had attended residential school, 
and it would take 10 years for the Canadian, Canadian government to work out the details of this class action suit. And in 2006, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement compensation package was announced and implemented in September 2007. The settlement agreement was composed of five par parts, and one of those parts was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. It was estimated that more than 150,000 Indigenous youth attended residential schools from the 1880s until the 1990s, with over 130 residential schools in operation during those years. And the very last residential school to close was the Gordon Residential School in Saskatchewan in 1996. An estimated 80 to 90,000 former students were expected to be affected by the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. And it was through the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement that initially created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And so you may be wondering, what exactly is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada? And I'm gonna to refer to this as the TRC moving forward. So the TRC launched in 2008. It had three commissioners, Justice Mary Sinclair, that I already shared a quote with you from. There was Chief Wilton Littlechild, as well as Marie Wilson. Uh, and within six years, the TRC hoped to achieve a number of ambitious goals, uh, including hosting several national events, issuing final reports that I shared with you already, establishing a national research center that became the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, as well as collecting all relevant documents from other church and government entities, as well as many other goals that they had and did achieve. The TRC mandate was to inform all Canadians about what happened in the Indian residential schools to document the truth of survivors, families, communities, and anyone personally affected by the legacy of the schools, and to guide and inspire a process of reconciliation and renewed relationship based on mutual understanding and respect. The TRC held national events where survivors shared their experiences and produced the several reports that I shared with you already. The Calls to Action report is a crucial component of the TRC, and it outlines 94 calls to action aimed at addressing the legacy of Indian residential schools and advancing the process of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples within Canada. These calls to action cover a wide range of areas, including child welfare, education, language and culture, health, justice, and reconciliation. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the Canadian government used several different school models to try and assimilate Indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life. And residential schools was just one of those school models. And as the title of the model implies, the children lived at the residential schools. Day schools was a subsequent model where the children attended the schools during the school hours and then they returned home in the evenings. And so the specific harms and experiences of students who attended day schools were not part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. And day school survivors have advocated for recognition and compensation for the abuses that they too suffered in these institutions. And in 2009, have also filed a nationwide class action suit against the Canadian government and is called the Indian Day School Survivor Settlement. The lawsuit was settled in 2019, and survivors were given up until January 2023 to submit a claim. It's estimated that nearly 200,000 Indigenous children attended day schools, with approximately 185,000 survivors submitting claims by 2022. And according to Indigenous scholar Dr. Jackson Pind, there was over 699 Indian day schools across Canada that operated from the late 19th century until 2000. Indian residential schools and Indian day schools have only just closed in the past few decades, and the schools still very much affect the minds and hearts of Indigenous survivors, their children, and their communities in the form of trauma and intergenerational trauma. Next, I want to talk about Blood Tribe member Dr. Katharina Chief Moon Riley, who conducted a research study on the biological impacts of residential schooling on the development of intergenerational trauma among Indigenous Canadians. Chief Moon Riley examined two factors. First was the allostatic load that intergenerational survivors experience and what their adverse childhood experience scores are. So the allostatic load means the wear and tear in your body uh, and how when it's uh, exposed to repeated stress or chronic stress. 
The adverse childhood experience refers to traumatic experiences one might experience during their childhood and can significantly impact their physical, emotional, and mental health throughout the duration of their life. And so Chief Moon Riley found that intergenerational survivors who have a mother that attended residential school had a moderate increase in their allostatic load. She also found that if you were the offspring of either a mother or a father who attended residential school, that you had a higher adverse childhood experience score. And this is a quote from her thesis. Current generations are being impacted physiologically by their parents' residential school attendances, which support the need of innovative health and healing strategies to address these issues. And so Chief Wayne Riley's research findings are important for us as Canadians to be aware of how colonization has influenced and continues to influence generations of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous children as we try to navigate and come to terms with what has happened to our families and what is happening to us currently with the crises that we face. I am often asked, when did the stolen children era end? And I would argue that we are still in a state of the stolen children era. The purpose of the colonial school system was to assimilate Indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life. When one school model did not work out, the Canadian government was not discouraged and did not give up. Instead, they just redesigned the school model and continued on with their primary objective, which was, as John A. Macdonald, um, said that I read to you earlier. As the Indians progress into civilization and finally disappear as a separate and distinct people, not by race extinction, but by gradual assimilation with their fellow citizens. And so the colonial school system is intimately intertwined with the objectives of colonization, which was to assimilate us until we no longer existed or claimed our indigeneity, as outlined in the Indian Act. And as I've already shared with you, one objective for the indigenous education in Canada was to assimilate the indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life, where we speak, read, and write either the English or the French language readily and well. And if we were no longer in a state of the stolen children era, my education would have looked very different. I would have been free to be educated using my people's Blackfeet, Blackfeet ways of knowing, being, and doing in our own traditional education system. I would have also learned to speak Blackfoot fluently. But instead, under the Indian Act, I was educated in a public school system where I was educated to speak, read, and write the English language readily and well. And although the blood tribe took control of their education system in 1988, we are still limited in what our education system can look like if we want our children to be accepted into Canadian colleges or universities. We must follow a provincial or territorial program of studies to receive one of their certified high school diplomas, as our Blackfoot knowledge system is not considered an equivalent to the provincial or territorial education system within Canada. While we do have some flexibility within the curriculum, we must continue learning a colonial school system that either favors either the English or French language. And if you'd like to hear more about how public education works towards an assimilative agenda, you can check out a podcast that I did last year with Shannon Moore and Stephen Hurley on their podcast called The Public Good. So I put a QR code up here if that's something that you're interested in taking a look at. And so you may wonder, why do we need reconciliation? And I hope by this point in my presentation that it's already clear why we need reconciliation in Canada. The process of truth and reconciliation is important for all Canadians to be a part of because it allows for a collective understanding and acknowledgement of the historical injustices and traumas inflicted upon Indigenous peoples by the Canadian government and the colonial structures they established and that are still in place today and that still benefits those who've settled upon these lands while simultaneously disadvantaging Indigenous peoples. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions that many Canadians hold on to in regards to colonization is that they believe colonization is something that has taken uh, place in the past. And to add to this misconception, it's also widely believed that colonization has benefited everyone. But these misconceptions are not true. Instead, colonization is a structure that means that it's ongoing and not an event that happened in the past. Colonization happens every day in Canada, and every day I'm living with the negative effects of being colonized. 
And just as I shared with you today, I'm not free to be educated in my own people's traditional knowledges and education system, or have my Blackfoot language be the primary language in the traditional territories of Blackfoot Confederacy, where I live, work, and play. As Indigenous peoples, we're constantly asked to just get over it. But if Canadians actually understood how, coloniz how colonization works and how it continues to negatively affect Indigenous peoples to this day, as I've tried to share with you today, I would hope that Canada would no longer ask us this question. Truth telling is so important for all of us as Canadians to engage in, just like we're doing here today. And far too often, Indigenous peoples are shamed for their present circumstances that we find ourselves in. But do Canadians understand how and why we are in the situations that we're in, like I've shared today? And I shared with you some of the statistics about Indigenous peoples, and I'm going to share another set of statistics with you that come from Statistics Canada. Indigenous peoples have the highest rates of socioeconomic distress, are least likely to be employed, have a lower total income, have a lower life expectancy, have the lowest high school graduation rates, are overrepresented in custody and community programs, and are more likely to be the victims of violent crimes than any other ethnic or racial group in Canada. We didn't do this to ourselves. We didn't write legislation to try and eradicate ourselves. We didn't willingly send our children to be abused in these colonial school systems with harsh punishments to ourselves if we did not comply. We didn't introduce certain policies that have had long-lasting and damaging effects upon generations of Indigenous peoples. Instead, we've been trying to survive something that's been forced upon us for over a century and a half. We need to be able to change the structures of oppression that are entrenched in our Canadian society so that Indigenous peoples have an opportunity to just get over it in a healthy way. And we can't do it alone. We need allies. We need Canadians to care about us. We need help to make these changes where we are no longer just surviving, but instead where we can thrive. We need the rest of Canada to actively engage in the truth and reconciliation because we need Canadians to contribute to healing the intergenerational wounds caused by colonization and the oppressive structures that colonization has built that the rest of Canadians benefit from at the expense of Indigenous peoples. We need Canadians to promote a more inclusive and equitable society for all. And the calls to action does just this. It provides us with a framework that shows us how to be good relatives to one another and how we will share this land that we now call Canada. It also provides us with a roadmap to ethically engage with one another and work towards healing and reconciliation. The calls to action shows us how we can come together and right the wrongs that Indigenous peoples experience in Canada. It also provides an opportunity for Canadians to learn about Indigenous cultures, histories, and perspectives, and hopefully fosters greater empathy, understanding, and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Ultimately, the process of truth and reconciliation is vital for building a more just, respectful, and harmonious society in Canada. But until then, we can't get over something that we are still currently facing and living with. Asking us to just get over it is asking us to accept the Canadian population turning a blind eye to what colonization has done to us and continues to do to us, and how that benefits the majority of Canadians who settled upon these lands. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks to the University of Lethbridge and to Rogers TV for their valuable support. And we also thank the Lethbridge Herald and other forms of media that come out and cover our presentations. Questions. If anyone has questions and would like to ask Tiffany, please line up here on my left-hand side. Introduce yourself, um, uh, stating your name, and keep your preamble as short as you can. We'd appreciate it. So questions, please line up over here. My name is Mark Edel. Yeah, colonization is horrible all over the world. When you look at every continent of the world has suffered and is suffering. I'm just wondering, where do you see Indigenous peoples here in Canada in about 100 years? What is your vision? What do you think will happen to all of you? Thank you for your question. 
I'm very hopeful that as Canadians, we can all engage in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action, and that I would hope that in 100 years from now, that we will be in a better place than we are today. In that quote that I read from Justice Marie Sinclair, um, he talked about how seven generations of Indigenous children were put through the residential school system, and it is something that's going to take us another seven generations to get out of, but we can't do it without everyone's help in Canada. So if we are not able as Canadians to work on the calls to action, we're going to continue on in the exact same patterns that we are currently facing. Indigenous peoples will uh, be, if not the same, in, in worse conditions than we are today, if that's something that we're not able to do as Canadians and get on board with the calls to action. So. Very hopeful that we will be and that we will have some positive changes within the next seven generations or 100 years from now. Thank you. Tiffany, thank you for your presentation. My name is Violet Meekma. Um, I, uh, I know I should have researched this myself and I will, I promise I will, but I've always been kind of wondering about the basis for the day school claims. And maybe you can expand on that a bit. And I'll tell you my background, I went to a one-room country school a long time ago, mm -hmm. as did my parents in the same communities. And I know that parents there um, had by law the requirement to send their kids to school in my day as well and in their day. And you could be charged with an offense if you didn't do so. Uh, I also witnessed a lot of corporal punishment. And my parents experienced that. Um, it's, it seems that the experiences probably on the reserves would have been similar in my mind to what we actually went through, but I know it would be much more difficult not coming from a European culture. So I'm just wondering if you could expand a bit on the base of the claims. I know as well that um, from my parents' experiences, they went to school with kids who didn't speak English, and they were beaten if they didn't speak English on the school grounds if they spoke German or Ukrainian. So, you know, the experiences might have been similar, but I'm interested in hearing how they would be different and the basis. Thank you. Thank you for your question, and there's kind of two questions in that, so I'll, I'll tackle the first one. So the Canadian government, the objective of the colonial school system was to assimilate Indigenous children into a Eurocentric way of life. And so they actually did this through two tactics, which was, first was assimilation through segregation, and then it moved on to assimilation through integration. And assimilation through segregation was not working out, and that was something that they attempted for uh, nearly a century, and that is when we were forced on our reserves, and they opened up different school models, and they were trying to teach us to be like the rest of Canadians. And the Canadian government realized that this was not really an effective way of assimilating Indigenous children, and so they decided that they were going to try a different tactic, and that was through integration. And that would take some time in order to ready Indigenous children to be sent off reserve and to be educated with non-Indigenous peoples. And so there were different school models that the Canadian government had created to try and make this uh, a transition that they thought would work, but um, public school was something that was actually the ultimate goal for assimilation. The Canadian government felt that if Indigenous children could go off reserve and to learn to be educated with non-Indigenous children, that English language or the French language and Canadian values would rub off on Indigenous children and that when they would come home, it would also rub off on their parents. And so they thought that this would be the most effective way at assimilating all of Indigenous people into Eurocentric society. And so that was the basis of the the day schools on the Blood Reserve. The Canadian government, uh, around the 1960s, 1970s, we started to see them try and uh, shut down the residential schools that they had. There's a lot of history that, that goes, went on with that. Uh, a lot of the religions were not happy about that and they fought to keep them open. But the Canadian government um, was trying to get children to go to public schools. 
and there was a lot of uh, resistance from parents, indigenous parents, because they didn't want their children to go off reserve. There was a really big concern that indigenous children would face racism if they went off reserve. And so they weren't very comfortable with that. And public schools, you actually had to convince the um, superintendent, the school districts, the parents to allow indigenous children into those schools. And so it was, it was a transition period that took quite a number of decades before we started to see indigenous peoples attending public schools uh, on a regular basis. And while they were trying to transition from residential schools to public schools, they ended up opening day schools. And that was for indigenous children who uh, didn't want to go to the residential schools and who didn't want to go to the public schools. And because it was law that they had to have education, they needed to come up with another school model. And so that was the basis of day schools that Indigenous children went to. And some of these school models uh, existed at the same time as one another. And so that would um, be the residential schools as well as day schools. Uh, and so that would, I think that answers your first question. And the second question is it is very different. Um, the experiences, I don't think that we can really, there may be similarities, but they are very different. Um, for Indigenous peoples, we are the only group in Canada or even in the world where there is legislation written about us to try and eradicate us. So other culture groups may have experienced something similar, but they didn't have laws and legislation that forced them to relocate on small tracts of land that were out of sight and out of mind. There were not laws and legislations written where they couldn't practice their culture or their language. Uh, and so there may be similarities, but there are very big differences as well that we need to be mindful of. Thank you. My name is Knut Peterson. Uh, thank you very much, Tiffany, for coming to tell us about where we at and where we've been. Uh, on that note, I would like you to assess how we're doing in Lethbridge and maybe specifically the University of Lethbridge and the college who seem to have um, maybe a bit of a leadership in terms of, of uh, educating, uh, putting an emphasis on educating indigenous folks. Could you uh, give us a little bit of an assessment on how we're doing in Lathpits? So I can try and answer that question. I, I, I don't actually live in Lethbridge. I live by my reserve on the south end. And so I'm not very familiar with what is uh, taking place in Lethbridge in terms of reconciliation. Um, I know that they have hired uh, a particular person who engages in reconciliation um, activities and, and is very instrumental in, in inviting indigenous peoples to come in with truth and reconciliation and healing. And I think that's a wonderful step forward uh, because that's something that we haven't had uh, within, within Lethbridge before. I'm not sure if that is a common practice that they have in cities in Alberta or across Canada. It is a really wonderful start. I'm not connected to the college, so I unfortunately can't really speak to the college. Um, as an employee at the University of Lethbridge, uh, they just recently hired Dr. Leroy Littlebear to be the um, provost of Iniskim, and that is really a wonderful step as well. It is something that many universities across Canada have done years before, so we, we are a few years behind, but it is wonderful that we do have somebody who is there who's able to advocate for what we need at the university, and I think also has a um, larger impact on the city of Lethbridge as well. But thank you for asking the question. Thank you so much for your research and for coming here to present that as well as an overview of Truth and Reconciliation and the background on the stolen lives of through the residential school. My name's Bev Mendel-Atherstone. <clears throat> Listening very carefully to your talk, I'm quite curious what happened to the indigenous children after they finished school at grade three through six. 
Where did they go? Who took care of them? I also would like to know how many of the 94 calls to action have, have actually been implemented um, to the satisfaction of the Indigenous peoples? And I'd also like to know, to your knowledge, do you know what Rome is doing in terms of sending its documentation? And have they stopped stymieing this investigation? Did you say Rome? Yes, Rome. I know they have lots of documentation. Thank you. OK, so I'll try and remember all three of your questions. And the first one was about what the children after they finished residential school. Right. So the education was just meant to be elementary education because they were, they were forced to live on reserve. They weren't going to be going to university or college. It was actually illegal at the time. Indigenous peoples couldn't receive higher education. If they wanted to, they had to enfranchise, so that means give up their status. And uh, so the government wanted Indigenous peoples to either be farmers or ranchers. And it really depended on what your reserve decided that they were going to do, if they were primarily going to be farmers or primarily going to be ranchers. And so once the uh, children finished their education, graduated from the system, the Canadian government tried to get them to no longer uh, on the Blood Reserve, I'll, I'll give an example. There were different communities throughout the Blood Reserve that had um, all of their uh, lake elders living within those communities, so still living their traditional way of life, something that the Canadian government would go on to write amendments to try and get rid of language, culture. And so they didn't want the children going back to those villages because they knew that they would be with the elders and speaking their language and living their culture. And so they were trying to give them um, parcels of land in the reserve where they would be um, away from their elders and, and uh, their language and their culture. And so they were trying to get them to, um, to be farmers or ranchers and graduates would be given parcels of land together to try and get them to continue living those teachings that they had been taught in the colonial school system. And that is what happened for many, many years. They're 18, but they were only allowed to get a grade three, a grade four, a grade five, or a grade six education. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, the objective to make them highly educated. And they didn't have teachers who were actually qualified to teach in these education systems. So they didn't do very well at meeting the objectives. And so many of them would have learned grade three education throughout the majority of their life before being released at age 18. So off the top of my head, I cannot remember exactly the number of how many um, have been completed or considered complete. I do know in 2023 that there were no calls to action that were completed, and that was really um, very sad for us as Indigenous peoples that that was something that um, hasn't hasn't been that much of a priority in the past year and something that we're really hopeful will not be a pattern that we want to be able to see more calls to action happen there have been a few years since the time the trc has come out where there has not been any calls to action the year that had the most calls to action completed i believe is the year um, after they found uh, the um, graves at Kamloops, we started to see more actions, calls to action happen quite rapidly. And it really has to do with our allies. It's, it really has to do with the rest of Canada who's not Indigenous, standing up for Indigenous peoples and asking for these changes and for these calls to action to be completed. So I really would love to see more of these calls to action be completed and it really just start with you and making a difference. Rome. Um, I did do some uh, media interviews about that a few years ago when we did find out that there is a lot of records there. And in Canada, I know that there has been uh, some of the records that have been destroyed when they knew that the, the TRC was wanting to 
get copies. That was one of their mandates. And some of those, uh, some of those records were being destroyed. Researchers actually saw with their own eyes that um, some of the archivists and archives were, were destroying them so that they could not be um, copied into the national database. And so in Rome, it's something that we're asking for but I haven't heard any update on uh, whether or not anyone is being allowed to come over and to make at least a catalog of what they have so that Indigenous communities across Canada can then make that decision if they want to go all the way to Rome and either get copies or ask for those items back. So I, I haven't heard of any updates since then. But thank you for the questions. Hello, my name is Karen Tui, and thank you very much for your well-organized presentation. Uh, you said um, for you to move on, you need the support of all Canadians. I'm just wondering, what do you feel is the major stumbling block to get that support from Canadians? That is a, a good question. I, I think it starts within our own within our own reach, within our own power, so uh, within our own communities and the places that we work. It's taking a look at the calls to action and seeing what's applicable to us, where we live, and the places that we work, and asking for our um, employers to um, implement those calls to action, and even asking our own government, so asking the city of Lethbridge about some of these calls to action and holding them accountable. So are we asking our, our government here in Lethbridge what calls to action are they working on and how are they achieving that? So it, it is um, being able to continue working on that advocacy and keeping people accountable. Um, and without it, I am not sure that we will see progress, but I am still very um, hopeful that we will have people who will speak up and continue to advocate for changes and for the calls to action to be completed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, I remember as a small child, I used to bicycle near a residential school, but I didn't know it existed because it was a mile over the hill. Sixty years ago, I used to work in the north in the mining industry uh, with non-reserve people. And the interesting thing about those people was their education was sort of maybe grade five to six. I'm astounded when I look around at the blood and the Pecani Reserve where there's native school teachers, there's some doctors, there's lawyers. And if we can educate people, whether it's in the white system, so to speak, is that our goal where it gives you the energy where, as a group, to pursue your goals? Okay, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I know what your question is. Like, is our education system, is it giving your group the ability to move on and get what you need? I think it's having, th thank you for your question, I think it's having the freedom to be able to uh, use our own ways of knowing, being and doing in that. So. I myself am educated. I did my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD. Uh, and even though I did it in a colonial school system, I'm Dr. Preet, but I'm still uh, was able to come out on the other side and still continue to be indigenous and um, retain my identity as an indigenous person. And so I think that's something that uh, many indigenous peoples want to be able to have is is having that freedom that we don't have to do something a certain way like it was dictated to us for over a century and a half that we may be able to use those um, resources uh, but to be able to to have the freedom to use our own knowledge systems and for it to be considered valid because many indigenous peoples across the world our knowledge systems aren't considered valid compared to uh, non-indigenous knowledge systems like Eurocentric um, knowledge. And so um, being able to, to take the education system that we do have now and being able to integrate indigenous knowledge I think is, is really important and something that um, my own work I, I've taken a look at uh, and that uh, 
especially on, on our reserves, where reserves do have control over their education, being able to do it in a way that is still respectful to their own culture, their own languages, their own knowledges. So finding that balance, I guess, is, is something that um, would be important for us. Thank you. We've reached one o'clock, so I'll conclude with uh, thanking you very much, Dr. Preet, for your presentation. <laughs> Our next week topic is Susan Dielman. The, the presentation is Why Place Limits on Freedom of Expression. Um, before we leave today, may I ask you for, to give our audience a takeaway message to conclude today's event? Um, I think it's really important to be aware of uh, all of the different school models that the Canadian government used to try and assimilate Indigenous children. So we, we do focus a lot on uh, residential school survivors, and um, that's absolutely unnecessary as we do have a lot of survivors today who did go through the residential school system, but it excludes the other survivors from the other school models that are still alive today um, and who, who don't get enough attention and we don't learn enough about it as Canadians. And so I would uh, like you to keep that in mind and and how we're going to honor all of the survivors and their experiences uh, that they, they went through. Thank you. Thank you.